All right, Matthew 26, and uh, we got we went through 26, 27, 28 here last week. Uh, we talked at length about uh, the the verses here uh, dealing with uh, what Paul call, later calls the Lord's Supper. Uh, the Lord never calls it that. Um, it's a memorial service. Uh, it's a, actually rather interesting. We're going to see the Lord die here in a, in a chapter or two. And in the Acts period, you never see these guys do this. Um, and there's a reason why, uh, because he, he doesn't tell them as often as you do this, do in remembrance. Paul says that. Actually, over in Luke, it's an interesting thing. If you look over in Luke 22... I got to thinking about this because this brings out a lot of, of uh, consternation in a lot of people. Um, let's see, I got to find it here. Luke 22, if you look there at verse 17. Oh, da, 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 da. Our verse 19, I'm sorry, there he says, And he took bread and gave thanks and break it. And gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. Paul picks that phrase up from Luke, and he uses it in 1 Corinthians 11 there when he's going after uh, the uh, Corinthian church who are doing the Lord's table. That's really what Paul calls it. And they, if you look there at 1 Corinthians 11, it, it just... It, I was thinking about this today. That's what was on my mind because we were uh, in, in 1 Corinthians 11 there, verse 20. It says, when you come together into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. And uh, they were calling it that. So Paul deals with it because back in chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians and verse 21, he talks about, you cannot drink of the cup of the Lord or the cup of devils. You cannot be partakers of the Lord's table. And of the table of devils. So when you come back to Matthew 26, this is kind of where we were. We spent some time here. Uh, we're going to look at a couple more things and then kind of move on um, from it. The, the, uh, the thing that happens in this is you really, again, you get a lot of different ideas and uh, different things about it. People say, well, you're not supposed to do it because it belonged to the nation, to the little flock. But Paul says, I receive it, I'm giving it to you, 1 Corinthians 11 there. Um, I believe that's verse 23. I was just looking at it. Yeah, he says, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that, and then he gives it there. But he also adds, uh, as often, For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. That verse, verse 20, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 26, never shows up in the gospel accounts. So it's kind of a interesting thing that there's a little more information. Uh, Paul pu pulls this information more than likely from a conversation with Luke, and then the Holy Spirit uh, causes Paul to write it down. People tend to forget that Luke was a major companion of the Apostle Paul uh, through the Acts period, and then all the way down to the end of his life, he says, Dr. Luke, Luke, the beloved physician, is the only one here with me. So Luke had a strong influence on Paul as far as being a companion, having given the, written the, the gospel of Luke and also in the writing of the book of Acts. So he tra Luke travels with Paul. He's there with Paul. And uh, actually Paul quotes Luke several times in his epistles. So you know that they sat around the campfire and uh, had bi their own Bible studies and so forth, if you will, as uh, time progressed. But uh, anyway, verse 26 uh, here, uh, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remissions of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in, in my Father's kingdom. 
And, and again, we understand that when he says take the bread, he's not talking and that, that this is my body. It's a representation of it. It's a, it's a picture of it. It's not, a, it's not transubstantiation where the bread literally becomes the flesh. Uh, and it's not, tra- it's not consubstantiation, which it's, it, uh, the bread is the bread, but it really contains my spiritual presence. He is saying the bread represents my body. And what, I'm, what I do when I break it, and, and again, that's, what, that's where, where, what is going to happen to the Lord here. He, he, he's, what he's saying basically to these guys is, I'm going to be broken in death. It's going to be a very difficult death, one in which he's going to be broken. Take it, pass it around, break it, and they do that. So when you take the blood out of someone's body, when you take the blood out of the body, what does the body do? It dies. And that's really what's going to happen here. And that's the reason why these two emblems are separated. The life, uh, the, okay, the life of, the, of the flesh is in the blood. And when you separate that out, that's what he's doing here in death. Again, this event is a memorial uh, death. It's a, he's doing, he, he's, uh, it's emblems. It's, it, he's uh, making this representation of things. And uh, that's what he's going to do. Hebrews 9 verse 22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So again, we're, when we talk here about the bread representing his broken body, and then the cup. And uh, the, ju- the juice that's in the cup is really where everybody begins to have a cow, okay? And uh, it's something that's interesting because somebody will, some will say, well, there's wine in the cup. And some will say, no, it ought to be grape juice. And, you know, you get this back and forth and you get the religious arguments about it. And really the issue is here, what is in the cup? You know, he doesn't tell you what's in the cup. He says... This cup, if you look there at verse 27, and he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood. Now, obviously the Lord will never tell someone to drink blood. It's against the rules. It's against the law. So obviously whatever is in the cup is a representation. It's a picture. It's a type of the shedding of his blood. When I was growing up and we did communion at Shorewood, they use Welch's grape juice in the little cup. And the reason for that really <laughs> is the Welch family was a Christian family. And the grape juice empire that they built had its beginning and development around the idea of providing grape juice for communion services. That's where it started. And uh, that's uh, the issue here with them as well. Actually, you, 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 you know Hershey Chocolate Company? Hershey family was a Christian family, and they did that and so forth. So the contention here that kind of comes up is, uh, was it grape juice or was it wine? And nobody really can tell you yes or no which way it is. But I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you an idea because in verse 29 when he talks about henceforth of this fruit of the vine. So you have to remember that the Lord did drink wine, okay? He does drink wine. And if that bothers you, then you can take it up with the Lord when you see him, okay? I'm sorry if that bugs you, but for some it does and so forth, but here um, that's what's going to happen here. It, it's interesting, and uh, when we look here about the cup, just for a few minutes, and then we'll move on. The Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 11, never tells you what's in the cup. He doesn't say verse 29 at all. He really doesn't say much. He's completely a little different in the giving here. Uh, Christ doesn't say... So it's like it's incidental to him. It's not a big deal what's in the cup, okay? The religious bodies out there 
they will tell you what exactly ought to be in the cup. When I say religious bodies, the, the denominations, the Catholics, the Protestants, Christ never talks about it, nor does Paul ever talk about it. But the religious people, they don't let you know what it should be. So when you get around people who start talking about the religious handbooks <laughs> and what they ought to do and what it ought to be, then you, have, you need to be very careful. The point here is that this ordinance does state specific instructions, but it's not the way it is with the Lord's Supper. When those guys get to yak and they're going to tell you how to do it, what to do it, when to do it, and so forth. And we talked about that last time. The Plymouth Brethren, they believe in a weekly, but they have a closed. It's a closed communion. In other words, only they will tell who can be there. It's not open to everybody. So you've got all of these different things here. So what is supposed to be in the cup, I guess, is the question. And, and, and then how do you know? And again, there isn't any way to know positively without any question to be asked or raised, but there are some indications, and, and that is a wonderful thing about Bible study. If you come up hard and fast that it's got to be some way, and I present an, another way it can be, then guess what? It can't be a hard and fast way. It's got to be, you know, you got to leave room for that wiggle there. And, and when you talk here about the cup and the fruit of the vine and what's going on, then uh, you, you just have to look at it and say, okay, this is a good possibility of what it is. Look at Matthew 26, look at verse 29. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this, of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Come over with me to Isaiah. We're going to run some verses. Isaiah 65, Proverbs 3, Genesis 40, Deuteronomy. <laughs> so we're going to go. Isaiah 65, we'll just go one at a time. Isaiah 65, and talk about this fruit of the vine. Okay? Isaiah 65, and look at verse 8. Isaiah 65 and verse number 8. Thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servant's sake, that I may not destroy them all. My point, the point in 65.8, Isaiah 65.8, is the new wine is found where? In the cluster of the grapes. It's not found in the bottle. Okay, so grape juice is what's in the cluster when you squeeze it. So it's grape juice, and yet, what is it called? New wine. That'll help you understand the wine, new wine, and so forth, what he's dealing with. Come on over to Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs 3 and verse number 10. Proverbs 3 verse 10. <clears throat> so shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. In other words, when they take the cluster of the grapes and you hold it, okay, that's where the new wine is, and you go take the grapes and you put them in the press over there, and new wine is squeezed out. That's the issue here. Now, come over to Genesis chapter 40. Genesis chapter 40. Genesis 40, start in verse number 9. Genesis 40 and verse number 9. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream, behold, a vine was before me. And in the vine were three branches, and it was as though it budded, and her blossoms shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and I gave the cup into Pharaoh's hands. What's this guy doing? He's making grape juice, isn't he? He, ta the, he takes Pharaoh's cup, he takes the cluster of grapes, and he presses those grapes in his hand, and what comes out? 
grape juice and it goes into Pharaoh's cup. All right? Now, come over to Deuteronomy chapter 29. Moses here is talking to Israel uh, as they come out of Egypt and uh, the time that they're going to spend in the wilderness. Deuteronomy 29. Deuteronomy chapter 29 and verse number 5 and 6. Deuteronomy 29, 5 and 6. Deuteronomy 29, 5. And I have led you 40 years in the wilderness. So we're in the wilderness. Moses is talking to Israel. They've come out and they're going to spend time in the wilderness. Verse 6. Ye have not eaten bread, neither have ye drunk wine or strong drink, that ye might know that I am the Lord your God. Did they drink wine in the wilderness? No, they never, they did not. Come over to chapter 32 of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 32, verse 13. Deuteronomy 13, I'm sorry, 32, 13. He made him on the high place of the earth that he might eat the increase of the fields and he made him to suck honey out of the rock and oil out of the flinty rock, butter of kine, and milk of sheep with fat of, ram of lambs, and rams of the breed of Bashan, and goats were the fat of kidneys of wheat, and they drink, did drink the pure blood of the grape. Notice that, the pure blood of the grape. That's what they drank. They did not drink wine, they drank grape juice. And the indication is, is that they didn't drink the wine, but they did drink the blood of the grape. And that's important because the issue in Scripture, grape juice is a type of blood. The pure blood of the grape. Yes? Because of the uh, blood of the grape, the grape juice, you go ferment it and it becomes the wine and the strong drink. So it's not pure any longer. This is pure. It's right, right now. Come, it's undiluted. When you, uh, Linda juiced some tangerines or some the other day. No, lemons, I'm sorry. And she juices them and then she puts them through the cheesecloth to catch all the stuff. So it's a dilution down of the pure juice out of the... Out. So the pure blood here, that's un, unadulterated, not messed with, squeeze, and there it is. Okay? So the issue here, again, is the blood, the pure blood of the grape. And it's defined here in the verse that way. So when you have a cup, and the contents of the cup, Matthew 26 is going to represent, go back to Matthew 26, blood, the shedding of, he says, hey, this cup is the blood, is my blood, 26, 28, for this is my blood of the New Testament. When, you, when you're going to have the contents of the cup represent blood, it's logical that it would be what? Grape juice. Not wine, like they're liquored up. Okay, but grape juice. So if you think about this, the cluster sits on the table. Christ takes the grapes, presses them into the cup, as the custom was, Genesis 40. They literally see him press the grapes out, the blood of the grape, as in a wine press. All of that is picturing about where he's about to go. He's going to Calvary. He's going to suffer under the wine press of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. And you see this in pictures, in a picture here. We're going to read down here in a little bit, down into Matthew 26. And there's going to be a cup that's going to show up. And uh, he's, he comes up out of the garden there and he's going to say, Hey, I've got to go drink my cup that the Father's given me. And uh, that cup that he's going to go drink is going to be the issues at Calvary. But here now, in Matthew 26, the, again, if you think about in the Scripture, wine, 
it's grape juice. And that is a picture of the blood. That's the idea, okay? So that's really a good reason, I guess, to use grape juice if you used it in communion. We don't do that here. We have a fellowship meal and so and different things. So you just want to look at, you're back here in Matthew 26, I hope. So the fruit of the vine there in verse 29, when he says, hence of forth of this fruit of the vine, that's Deuteronomy 32, 14, and that's that pure blood of the grape. That's what he's talking about, okay? So verse 29, but I say unto you, I will not... Drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my king, father's kingdom. Now, the drinking of the fruit of the vine it, 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 until that day when I drink it new with you. He's not talking about drinking new wine with them. Okay? He's talking about the drinking being what's going to be new. He's talking about a new type of a relationship that they're going to have. That's what he's dealing with. It's, it's going to be new in, in its manner and its quality because it's going to be that issue of the new covenant. When the new covenant is in effect, it's going to be a new way of drinking, a new fellowship that they're going to have. That's why in verse 28 there when he says, this is my blood of the New Testament. See, that new covenant belong, promises that personal, individual regeneration and forgiveness of their sins and the covering of their iniquities and the personal relationship that God is, 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 is now going to have with the individuals in the nation as they go forth. And it's going to be a new fellowship. It's going to be a new relationship. He's going to write the law in their hearts. They're going to go do it. He's going to have this new thing, this whole new. So when he says there, I, I, will, I will not drink you know, until the day when I drink it new with you. He's, he's not talking about new wine. He's talking about the new relationship. And the memorial here is a, representat is a representative and a typical display of the new fellowship that they were going to have under the new covenant in the millennial kingdom uh, when the merits of the blood of Christ are applied to the nation. If you come back to chapter 19 of Matthew, we've already seen this, um, and we've discussed this already. Though The merits here that is going to identify Israel with her Messiah in the resurrection uh, is going to produce something. It's going to produce regeneration. It's going to produce the resurrection life. Matthew 19, 28. And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you that ye which have followed me in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye shall also sit upon twelve thrones judging the twelve tribes. When do they do it? In the regeneration, Israel is expecting a national regeneration. Uh, again, a giving of eternal life, a giving of spiritual life and eternal life. And uh, they expect to get it out there in that kingdom that's coming to them. And uh, that's that new type of a relationship that they are going to have. So, when we, and, and again, we've talked about this issue. If you come over to Mark 10, you, you see it here. Uh, so they're following that issue of the new covenant. And uh, Mark 10, verse 28. Mark 10, 28. And that's what they're looking for. So what he's telling these guys is here's a memorial I won't be here to eat with you, but it's a memorial that you're going to keep, and I won't do this with you anymore until the day out there in the kingdom, in the future. And when that happens, then we'll drink, drink anew here and so forth. Mark 10, 28. Then Peter began to say unto them, Lo, we have left all and have followed thee. And Jesus answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that sitteth 
I'm sorry, there is no man that hath left house or brethren or sister or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brethren and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions, and in the world to come, eternal life. See, they're going to have eternal life out there in the future, in that millennial kingdom, where the new covenant is placed into effect. And in Matthew 26, when the Lord says, this is the blood of my New, of, uh, this is the blood of the New Testament which is shed for many what the cross is going to do is ratify and establish uh, the, the com, come over with me to Hebrews chapter 10 the cross is going to ratify and establish the New Testament the new covenant but it does not inaugurate it it doesn't put it into effect what activates it is the com, his coming in the kingdom, and putting the elements into effect just like the old covenant. So you've got, remember Exodus 24, last time we, we looked at, Moses stands there and he says this is the blood of the covenant and sprinkles everything, but the covenant doesn't go into an impact. And, uh, you know, five chapters later, Exodus 29, then it's go into effect. That's what's at Calvary, the shedding of blood, ratifies it. But it doesn't go into effect until the millennial kingdom, until he comes and the kingdom is established. So there's that, that delay again, if you will. We understand that. We elect a president in November. He doesn't take office till late January. We understand that. There's an election, it's, go, it's done, and then the, he's put into place. The shedding of the blood ratifies it, it's done, but it doesn't go into impact until right over here. Okay? Calvary ratifies it. Then there's a transition team, if you will. And uh, that transition is that early Acts period. He's supposed to come back, set it up, and obviously Paul interrupts all of that. Dispensation of grace interrupts that. And... Uh, it doesn't it won't be back into it won't be implemented until after we're gone in the 70th week and all those other great events happen look at here at hebrews 10 look at verse 9 hebrews 10 verse 9 then said he and again the he here lo i come to do thy will o god that's going to be the son back up in verse 7 he taketh away the first well what would that be Old covenant, that he may establish the second, new covenant. The first is going to go away. Calvary will take care of all of that, deal with it, boom, and he's bringing in the new covenant. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Calvary covers it all. Verse 16, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. Notice that, after those days. Not on that day, after those days. And actually, after those days is going to end up being the trip, the 70th week of Daniel, as, as we continue here. The, um, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts, and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. There's Jeremiah 31, the new covenant. Now where, now where remission of the, the, these is, there is no more offering for sin. There's a once-for-all sacrifice for sin, Calvary. That, this is the blood of the New Testament shed for the remissions of sins of many. There it is, Calvary. Verse 19, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. So the new and living way is where the merits of the blood of Christ are applied to the nation. They are identified with their Messiah. 
not just in his rejection, but now also in his resurrection. So this identification with his life results in that regeneration that they're looking for. You follow that? Okay. Now, back in Matthew 26, on your way back to Matthew 26, stop in Luke 24. In Matthew 26, 29, th this is a great day. Okay? And what you have to remember is when he says this to them, they do not grasp all that this, all that the moment when he says this to them, and all these other things that he taught to them, they don't grasp the, you know, momentous occasion that this is. They don't, he, he's teaching them, uh, and he, he's revealing things to them th that he, they just are like, okay, whatever you say. They don't understand the ramifications of it just yet. All right, he's teaching them in view of more information that he's going to reveal to them after his resurrection. Look at Luke 24, 45. Key in this to always be, have this verse in the back of your mind. Uh, you, you, you got Luke 24, 45. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand what? The Scriptures. This is after his resurrection, 24-1, upon the first day of the week. Very early in the morning, they go. Okay? You go over there to John chapter 19, I think it is. Yep, 20, John 20, in verse 9, he says, For as yet they knew not the scripture that he must rise again from the dead. Wait a minute. He's done told them, but what were they not doing? They weren't believing it. They weren't walking by faith. They were walking by sight. They're looking over here. He's dead. He's in the ground. That was John 20, verse 9. You guys take a note. Sorry. But in Luke 24, 45, he doesn't open that. Now he's going to start the 40-day seminar, Acts 1 there, verse 1 to 3. He starts dealing, teaching them and opening up their mind. So at this point, you go back to Matthew 26, when he gives them all of this instruction here, they still don't believe him. They don't believe he's going to go die. That's what they don't believe, okay? Uh, but yet here he is, the night before he dies, they still don't understand that. And we'll see that here as we go down now. And uh, it's only later, Luke 24, after the fact that, you know what it does? They go, oh, that's what that meant, <laughs> That's how in Acts 1, Peter can get up and quote Psalms about a bishopric that belonged to Judas. And yet when you go back to Psalms, it doesn't say Judas. And he can make the connections between the Psalms and what's going on and getting Matthias chosen and so forth. Why? Because he has his eyes have been what? Opened. The understanding lay, lies there now. So when we're back here in the Old Testament and time past, they didn't get it, but as he begins to unfold for them, the early Acts period, they begin to see how it comes together. And uh, then the, when the fullness of the revelation that Christ gives to the Apostle Paul, and they, they see the fullness of the cross are made known, that capstone of progressive revelation is made known, then uh, they really begin to catch on and see what's going on, okay? Paul's revelation doesn't just impact the body of Christ. It also impacts the kingdom saints, the kingdom program. And the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John have to be understood in that light. Otherwise, you're going to be in trouble. And again, we understand the entire Bible in the light of Paul's revelation because that is the frame of reference we work for, from today. That's where we come from. So back to Matthew 26, okay? So when he, when he does all this, again, what's in the cup? We don't know. More than likely, it's grape juice, the fruit of the vine, okay? There's no hard way. If you want to say it's, it's wine, 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 then go ahead, knock yourself out. You know, again, if you don't like it being grape juice, take it up with the Lord, you know, because, but the fruit of the vine, Deuteronomy says, 
is that issue of the grape juice, the, the, the pure blood of the grape. So, um, you know, work that out yourself. Paul doesn't tell us what it is. Christ doesn't. You just kind of have to leave. And this is, gets back to what I, I think I said last time or in, some, in a conversation here. What usually happens is, is when we come out of denominations or religious groups and we fail to walk through the identification truths of chapters 6, 7, and 8 of Romans, we bring some of that baggage with us. And the next thing you know, you're saying we shouldn't be doing something that Paul says, I got it, I'm giving it to you. You know, and the crazy thing, the crazy thing, it's not crazy, but the interesting thing about the Lord's table for us, Paul gives it to us there in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, for as often as you do this, he doesn't regulate how often you do it. He doesn't even tell you how to do it or when to do it. He's by actually the conclusion that he gives is to the Corinthians is, is when I get there, we, I got more stuff to say. It's like, well, where is that? Well, it's for him between him and the Corinthians in the first century. See, if Paul says you have to have, you know, Steiner grape juice, and you can only use row crackers, what would everybody be looking for? Steiner juice and row crackers that only existed in the first century. The price just went up, exactly, see? Okay, so if he said you got to do this and that, what would everybody be doing? Worshiping that rather than stopping and thinking about, hey, do this in remembrance of me. You do show the Lord's death till he come. See, instead of thinking about all the aspects of who you have in Christ and the wonderfulness of that, now we're worried about cups and plates and all this crazy stuff. And that's why we do what we do with the fellowship meal and kind of shift a little different, okay? All right, Matthew 26, verse 30. Let's get on down here. We got few minutes here and when they had sung a hymn they went out into the in, into the mount of olives they're going to sing the hallelujah psalm psalms 115 to 118 there and they go out into the night all right uh psalms 118 ends with them binding the sacrifice and placing it on the altar and that's exactly now what's going to happen here with uh with these guys uh, by the way, you guys taking notes, I think at Psalms 118, I think it's like verse 27 for the guys taking notes here. And I can look. Yep, uh, the last verse in the 118 is 28, but 27, they bind the sacrifice with cords, even under the horns of the altar. And that's exactly now what they're doing with the Lord going to Calvary. All right, verse 31. Then saith Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. For it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter answered and said unto him, Praise the Lord, hallelujah, you're going to go die and rise again. That's not what he said, is it? Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that thou this night, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples. Christ is going to begin to warn them now. Of a what's ahead of, of what's ahead for him, and what's ahead for them, and when he does it, human nature pops up, and uh, sticks its little head up right here, and uh, if again you want to see human nature for what it really is all about, just look at these events here at the cross of Christ, and as they begin, as these events begin to take place around that. Verse 31, Then said Jesus unto them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night. No, it's, you guys, you're going to have a, you're going to have a bad night. It's going to be scandal. <laughs> you're you're going to have trouble tonight because of me. But notice the next two words. For it is, what? Written. He says, you, you know why I know that you guys are going to be offended of me this night? For it is written. 
what I will smite the shepherd and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. He says, because of Zechariah 13, verse 7, which is what he's quoting there, you know what's going to happen? You guys are going to be offended of me tonight. You're going to have trouble tonight. Now, what's interesting in this is how close Scripture, the Word of God, was held in the life of Christ. He held it close. He says, I know what's going to happen. You know why I know what's going to happen? Because the book says it's going to happen. See that? If you want to see the heart of the Lord, what does he say? For it is written. This is why I, why I said you guys are going to be offended because of me this night. Why are you going to have a tough night tonight is because Zechariah 13, 7 said so. Holds it close. Now watch Peter. Because notice the problem that Peter has. Verse 33. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Christ said what? All, you, you, all, of, all ye shall be offended, for it is written. Peter, in verse 33 directly denies the statement that the Lord just made based on the Word of God in verse 31. Christ says, all of you will deny me. Peter said, no, though everybody does, not me, see. You don't know me, Lord. I don't care what the Bible says, for it is written. I'm not going to do it. See how Peter just, human nature. Now, I don't think you and I have ever really said anything like that. Nah, just because the book says it, I, I won't do that. But you know what? <laughs> Usually what happens? We're, we're, the frailty of our human nature comes out quickly. Peter's problem was self, he was self-willed. I don't care what the book says, I know what I believe. So what did the Lord say, verse 33? Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night, before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. Christ's confidence obviously wasn't in Peter and what Peter said. His confidence was what was in the Scripture. And that ought to cause you to pause and to remember the Bible is negative toward man and positive toward God. But it ought to cause you to pause, you and I both, and say, wait a minute, let's have the mind of Christ in this matter, and let's see what the book says, and let's go by that. Christ said, Pete, if it's up to me to depend on you not doing it, it forget it. I'm going to trust the book. Okay? So that's the that's where Peter was, that's, but that's human nature. And again, Peter meant what he said. Peter's a commercial fisherman. You know, those guys are usually, they say their words, their bond type thing. And uh, they're tough guys. They go out, they do it. But you know what, though? They stand by their word. And when he says, Peter, Pete, Peter says, yet will I never be offended, I'm going to stick with you, Christ, Lord. I'm going to stick by you. I don't care what anybody else says. I don't care what Scripture says. I don't care any. I'm going to stick there. And you know what the Lord says? No, nope, the book says you're going to deny me. You're going to be offended. And Peter ignores the Word of God. He denies the Word of God. Basically what Peter's saying, and really what everybody says, my determination is what God's Word says will not come true. I determined to not do what that verse says. You say it, but I'm going to, uh, you know, and I'm going to prove the case. And yet, what does Hebrews 4.12 tell us? That the Word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword? Quick and powerful? It's a life-giving and energetic, but it's also a discerner of the thoughts and what? intent of the heart. 
And that's the thing that comes in and just cuts you to the quick. It reads you. It, my dad always said, it reads your meter, you know, and that's where it is. So really the only safe place for, uh, for us, for you, for me, is to be right here in the Word of God and be submissive to it. Now in verse 36, we're going into the Garden of Gethsemane, Matthew 26, 36. Then cometh Jesus with them, saying, I'm sorry, unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. You stay here, I'm going to go over here and pray. Verse 37, And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Then said he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. Now, they go into Gethsemane. Now, Gethsemane, that word means oil press. It doesn't mean wine press. You'll hear it said that way, or grape press. It's literally a garden that sits at the foot of the Mount of Olives, uh, beyond the brook Kedron, John 18 says. But if you, what is the Mount of Olives? What's on, what, what do you do with an olive? You press it. See, you don't, uh, you know, you pit it and you dump a bunch of good stuff in the pit and you sell it on the, right? you know? but if you go to the olive factory down there, what do they, and you get olive oil, they're pressing it. So he's not pressing out the blood of the atonement. Oil is a type of the spirit. So what's going to happen here at Gethsemane is that the very life of Christ is literally going to be squeezed out of him. He's pressed. That's why you're going to see some things here when he says, pray, pray with me. He says there in verse 37 that he began to be sorrowful and very heavy. Verse 38, then said he unto them, my soul is what? Exceeding sorrowful. Tarry he and watch with me. Pray for me, guys. My life is just literally being squeezed out of me. And that's the agony that he's going to go through here. Now, the book of Matthew doesn't give you all of the details about this event. Come over to Luke. You get really more detail in Luke. Luke 22. Look at Luke 22. Because Luke is designed to give you the personal, individual sufferings of Christ. And in Gethsemane, Luke adds the mo most of the details. And again, when, you, when we come to the cross, Luke, uh, he almost skips over the details. Uh, because by the time Christ got there, his sufferings were no longer his personal sufferings as the man of Christ, but now he is God's sacrifice. And as we go down through in Matthew there, we'll see some of that as well. Luke twenty two forty four, Luke twenty two forty four. And being in an agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling down to the ground. There's a, in medical science, there's that condition there that has to do with something that happens with such strain and physical and emotional agony that the capillaries in the skin burst and the blood gets mingled in with the sweat. So you've got pretty intense sweating going on here. <laughs> uh, and again, the, the tremendous physical and emotional and spiritual agony that's going on here. So he's going to go into Gethsemane. Come back to Matthew 26. He goes into Gethsemane, the olive press, and it's as though the very life of Christ is going to now be pressed out of him. Okay? And it's going to be very intense, and it's going to be very all-consuming. That's why he's going to say three times, pray with me. Pray for me. I'm going to be praying over here and so forth. Um, he, 
in, in that very sorrowful and exceeding sorrowful and even unto death issue comes really here because of, their, because of his rejection as well. Um, if you look back up at verse 32, notice he says, But after I am risen again, I will go before you into Galilee. Peter doesn't say, Woohoo, he's going to be resurrected. They don't understand that, see, still. All right? But where, when he says that, I will go before you into Galilee, where did, they, where did he first meet these guys? Matthew 4, go back there. He met them in Galilee. Matthew 4 and verse 12. Now, we'll see this when we get over in Matthew 28 there at the end, when he's going to go meet them and so forth after the resurrection. But just notice something, 4.12, Matthew 4, verse 12. Now, when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed into where? Galilee. Galilee becomes the place of his rejection. Verse 18. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brethren, Simon called Peter and Andrew his brother, Verse 19, and he said unto them, follow me. Verse 21, and going on from thence, he saw other two brethren, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, uh, in in a ship, uh, mending their nets, and he called them. Verse 23, and Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing all manner of sickness and of disease among the people. He's up in Galilee when they first meet him. They first begin to follow him. Now when you come over here to Matthew 26, he says, you guys are going to be offended by me. You guys are going to forsake me. You're going to deny me. You're going to be scattered. But when I rise again, guess what? I'll meet you right back where we started. I'm going to meet you back up there in Galilee. And you're going to be offended. You're going to deny me. You're going to be scattered. But guess what, guys? It isn't the end. We got to re- it isn't over. We have a new beginning. And rather than the cross being the fall of Israel, it actually results, resulted in a renewed opportunity being given to the disciples. Right in the midst of it, he says, I know what's going on. You're going to forsake me, but I'm going to rise again. And when I do, don't worry, I'll have it all taken care of. We'll see that when we get over in Matthew 28. And we'll just meet over there, and we're just going to start all over again. Only this time, it's going to be under the new covenant and not the old. And it'll be something brand spanking new. He takes them into Gethsemane and says, come on, guys, let's go get this over with. (laughs) The hour has come. You, You guys come and pray for me. Think about this. Judas has left. He's gone. So we got 11, right? You eight disciples sit here, pray for me. Peter, James, and John, you come with me. And he pulls them away, verse 38. He takes them a little further, Matthew 26, 38. And he says, My soul is exceeding sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. You guys were up there with me on Mount Transfiguration. You saw the glory, these three guys, see? You saw all that splendor. I want you to see this too. You were a part of that over there. I want you to be a part of this here. Verse 38, tarry ye here. Verse 40, and he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and said unto Peter, what could it could ye not watch with me one hour? The, the hour of darkness had come. Couldn't you just stay focused for one hour, guys? They were asleep. Verse 43. And he came and found them asleep again, for their eyes 
were heavy. They're asleep again. You know, on the Mount Transfiguration, Matthew 17 over there, there was Moses and Elijah, and what they do? They fall on the ground, and they on their faces, they couldn't behold the glory. They're going to do this and that. And when they get up, they didn't see anybody but who? Christ. Here they are again. They were there with him in the glory show. Now they're here with him in the suffering. And now, typical to their spiritual condition, they are asleep. And they never enter into what is really happening here. Their eyes were heavy. Hebrews says their ears, they were dull of hearing and blind to what was going on. Their eyes were heavy. So it is instructive here that in Matthew, the Lord is now going to be the king in rejection. He is the rightful king, but he's just now being cast out. And uh, it's a constant thing over and over and over again. All right, verse 39. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me, nevertheless not as I will, but as thou wilt. He goes a little further. Again, He leaves them, he says, stay here, and he moves away from them. And he's going to pray. And there's something very important here in in his prayer. Uh, Come over to Mark 14. Mark 14. Something very fascinating here about his prayer. Mark 14, verse 34. Start there. Again, Um, Matthew doesn't give the details. He just says, we're getting up to the king being crucified. (laughs) The king is rejection, rejected. He's cast out. He's set aside. He's no no longer. He's going to, so he's, so Matthew's moving us that way. Mark 14, verse 34, and saith unto them, my soul is exceeding sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. You see, he prays and he says that, Abba, Father, the only time in all of the word of God that anyone ever addressed the Father as Abba Father is right here. Okay? Because that address of Abba Father is a privilege of the imminent, immediate Son. It's the privilege of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a privilege of God the Son addressing His Father. Okay? Now, come over to Galatians 4. Galatians 4. Because what now? Galatians 4 and verse 6. Galatians 4, verse 6. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. If you're a member, if you, as a member of the body of Christ, As a son, as an heir of God, a joint heir with Christ, if you pray in the Spirit, what are you going to say? Abba, Father. He sent forth His Son, the Son of His, I'm sorry, the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, crying to pray here, to claim. See, you and I have, the wonderful, by the way, Romans 8, verse 15, is Abba Father, Paul, again, in this issue of sonship. And on our Sunday morning study, when we get over in Romans 8, and we see the son issue, and our sonship status, tremendous. That's why I keep saying these identification truths alter everything moving forward. When he, we, as son. 
we can claim the position that we have in Christ and we can cry, Abba, Father. So we can pray like who we are in Christ. Now that's wonderful. So when you come back to Matthew 26 and he cries, Abba, Father, guess what? That's our kind of praying, <laughs> if you will. Now, I know Matthew 26, a dispensational setting and so forth, and I'm not talking about the Jewish program that he was living under and everything, okay? But this is God the Son praying to God the Father. That's what you're looking at here, Matthew 26. He does it three times, by the way, verse 39. He fell on his face and prayed. Verse 42, he went again the second time and prayed. I'm back in Matthew 26. And then in verse 44, he left them and went away again and prayed the third time. So he's going to go pray, and he does it three times. And again, you will see, we're going to look at this because time's up. We'll, we'll get into the prayer a little deeper next time. We'll, you'll see the deepness of the conflict that he was in. It, the, the conflict and what was going on, the sufferings, didn't drive him away from God, the Father. It actually drove him to the Father. That's our kind of praying. The conflict, the difficulty, doesn't raise a barrier between Christ and, and the Father, us and the Father. Rather, it causes him, it causes us to come and depend more on the Father. His distress deepens his intercession. It deepens his submission to the Father's will. And, it, and for you and I, it's the same way. Each time he becomes more, each time he prays, he becomes more committed to being, to submitting to the will, Father's will, doing, that's why he says there in verse 39, not as I will, but as thou wilt. If there's any other way to do this, okay. But I know there isn't, because it's your will. I don't care. I'll drink it. Let's get on with it. See, he's very conscious of what's go what the will of the Father is. And uh, that's the wonderful case here, the wonderful picture being painted here, especially about the prayer issue, that Abba Father, Mark 14. So when he's praying, he's Abba Father. <laughs> he's like that intimate relationship. And you and I, we have that because of who we are in Christ. Okay? So we'll pick up here with, the, with the, uh, the prayer a little more next time in verse 38, 39, uh, especially 39, okay? So th this, when he says there in verse 39, nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt, not my will be done, but your will, that's the absolute, that's him saying, I don't care what's going to happen. I'm trusting your word, Father, that you're going to raise me. You're going to do what you promised to do. Let's get on with the program. Let's go get this thing done. And uh, he's had that attitude since before the foundation of the world, when he knew the plan. And uh, he's been eager to do it. Okay? So we'll pick up in the prayer and a little bit more about the garden scene here especially here in verse 39 and following, all right? Uh, very fascinating and interesting part of Scripture because we're on our way to Calvary. Now, this event, starting back in verse 31 and so forth, uh, with the, the Passover upstairs, this is all in, in John. This is all in the upper room. It's just him and the twelve. Starts there in verse uh, 20. 2620. So in John, it's John 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, where all this takes place. So whenever you hear someone say, you got to read John first as a new believer, 
because it's such a great chapter and a great book and all this stuff. You just look at them and tell them they're nuts because three, a third of the book is he's talking to no one but the 12 apostles. And all the stuff that they love in John, he ain't even talking, he's not talking to even Israel. He's talking to the 12 apostles. So you just tell them to go read Romans <laughs> and see the real love story, okay? All right, dear Holy Father, we thank you for the evening, Lord. We thank you for your word. And above all, Lord, we thank you for who we are in your son. And we thank you that today, in the age of grace, we can cry, Abba, Father, as the Lord does here on the night as he goes to Calvary to shed his blood for the remissions of sins for the whole, for all of humanity. And we thank you for that. In your name we pray. Amen.